Good evening. Welcome to St. John's United Church of Christ. Those of you that are familiar with the congregation know that I'm not Dale, but Dale sends his greetings. Uh, he tested positive a couple of days ago for COVID. Uh, so bad, bad timing, uh, but he had a couple of colleagues that he was able to call and I was the one who was able to say yes. So my name is Greg Bain. I was pastor not far from here at Grace Emanuel Church on Story Avenue for 34 years prior to retiring a couple of years ago. So it's very good to be with you and, and I probably know you better than you know me just from knowing all your pastors during all that time. As we gather for Ash Wednesday this evening, let's sing our gathering song together. It is number 188. Let's stand if you are able and sing together. Please join me in our responsive call to worship. We gather together at the edge of a new season. We stand together on the cusp of something new. Will we wade into self-reflection? Will we invite honesty to dance? Will we listen for God's invitation? Will we seek deeper faith? What kind of fast do we choose? What kind of faith will we build? We gather together at the edge of a new season. Listen, God is still speaking. I had a professor in seminary named Dr. Frank Stagg, and he had a, a favorite lesson that he liked to teach us. 
particularly when he was teaching from the Gospel of Matthew and teaching out of the Sermon on the Mount, he would always say, faith is not a test we can pass. We spend a lot of time trying to make up tests that we can pass and call that faith. And Dr. Stagg said, nope. If you're looking at Jesus, faith has always depended on grace. It's not a test you can pass. And so especially on Ash Wednesday, our prayer of confession is a reminder of that kind of faith. Let us pray responsively. Merciful God, how many times in a day could we choose love? How many times could we speak kindly to ourselves? How many times, God, and how often do we miss it? Forgive us for hitching our horse to the world's measure of goodness instead of yours. With gratitude, we pray. When a baby is learning to walk, we don't scold them for falling down. Instead, we cheer them on with every step. God offers us that kind of love, no matter how, time, how many times we fall. It is that we are trying and that we keep getting up once again in his grace. Amen. Please stand in body or in spirit for tonight's scripture lesson, which comes from Isaiah chapter 58, verses 1 through 12. Shout out, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They want God on their side. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. You fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help and he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruin shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to live in. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I was raised a Southern Baptist, and maybe you can hear that. 
see some of you nodding. Um, we not only didn't practice Ash Wednesday, we didn't know what it was. And I remember being very confused when an English professor in college was trying to teach us about T.S. Eliot's poem called Ash Wednesday. And first of all, she had to tell all of us what it was. And so when I got to my first UCC church, I was pretty excited that I was going to get to help lead an Ash Wednesday service. I was the associate pastor. And you can imagine that I was a little bit crushed when I found out that that church, for whatever reason, did Ash Wednesday without ashes. I think they were following the rule that if the Catholics did it, we weren't going to do it. I think that that's the best I could figure it out. But it was terribly frustrating to me to be there for three years and do non-Ash Wednesday. So you can imagine when I got a soul pastorate, I was pretty excited about doing this, the, quote, the right way, and uh, save the palms from the Palm Sunday before and was all prepared to burn them. And I, I was kind of doing this on my own, so I took some of the palms. Now, you're going to, several times during this story, you're going to think, what was he thinking, okay? But I took the palms, I put them in a pan in the kitchen, and I lit them on fire in the basement kitchen. It never occurred to me that the kitchen was going to fill with smoke <laughs> or that the pan would become a problem, you know, with the fire in it. And so I, I was able eventually to get that uh, put out enough that I could kind of pull things together and get the what, what remained of the ashes into a little bowl, and I, I hadn't been clued in that you use olive oil, so my plan was to wet the ashes a little bit and kind of see what the consistency was, and I went over to one of those deep kitchen sinks like you have in church basements, and um, I misjudged the water pressure. <laughs> and so I turned the water, the cold water on, and the water hit that bowl, and the ashes went all over me, on my face, my shirt, my pants, and I looked at the bowl, and there are no ashes. So, you know, for the, the end of that story is, fortunately, there's a store called Tonini's. Have you heard of it? And I had enough time that afternoon to, to go to Tonini's and figure out how to get ashes and and I'll learn a little bit more about it. But that was my first remember that you are dust moment with it all over my face. So here we are on Ash Wednesday, very mindful of our mortality and wanting to get things right, if possible, with ourselves and with others and with God. A long time ago in the fourth century, the church decided that the time between now and Easter, the 40 days without the Sundays, was a very good time to think about Christ, to prepare ourselves for Christ, to do some special practices, uh, perhaps fasting, perhaps uh, abstaining from some other things. And so we, some from the fourth century on, the church has been practicing this, preparing ourselves for the, the sacrifice of Christ, getting in touch with our own ability to sacrifice, and maybe creating some open space in our hearts for God and for other people. Very often, we have read this passage of Scripture, Isaiah 58, and it's important to know when it was. Um, this is just as the exiles who have been taken away for a full generation in Babylon are returning, uh, returning to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is in rubble. Uh, it's hard to imagine a, a place like where we live in rubble. I uh, once had a German friend here, and I was driving him around the town, and he said something that really stuck with me. He said, I can see you have had no war. Can you imagine? Um, where he was from, 
and in his childhood, everything was leveled, just as we see now in Ukraine. And so the Jewish refugees are returning to a Jerusalem that is leveled. It is rubble. And they, of course, want to repent. They want to commemorate. They want to practice all the personal austerity they can to get back in touch with God in God's place to them. And so that's what Isaiah 58 is about. And the prophet is going, yes, do all those things, but don't forget what God wants in the meantime. Now, I'm going to ask you if you know what virtue signaling is. Some of you do, virtue signaling. Um, you know, it's a, it's a phrase for our time, isn't it? It's like if you, if you like somebody's post on Facebook and you feel like you've really done something, or you've got this or that sign in your front yard and you think you're changing the world. It's not that the opinion is wrong. It's that it's not enough. Sometimes we just like wear a bracelet or a ribbon and we think we have really done something. Well, it's a start. But virtue signaling is kind of what the Hebrews were doing. They were having festivals. They were having special prayers. But Isaiah said, what's the fast, what's the festival that God wants? Have you thought about that? What, what is it that God wants? Well, the first thing he said God wants is, yeah, repent. Uh, the Buddhists have a wonderful way of, of describing this. Drive all blames into one. Drive all blames into one. We spend a lot of time pointing at how bad other people are and how wrong they are. Instead of pointing the fingers back at us, driving all blames into one, realizing we're the problem. We, we can also be the solution, but for starters, we're the problem. And then second, Isaiah says, here's the list. Here's what God wants. Help innocent people get out of jail. Be fair in business. Feed hungry people. Give people clothes, help people build homes. And then the last one is, it, you know, some things never change. Help your relatives, please. It's funny that that's, he has to include that. <laughs> help your relatives, sometimes that's the hardest thing of all. Well, it all sounds pretty gritty, doesn't it? Not terribly glamorous. And yet if you think about it, it's almost exactly the same list Jesus gives us in Matthew 25. Of course, Jesus is reflecting on this precisely. That this is where you come face to face with Christ. Is in these least of these. These other people in need. So it's not glamorous, but it's also very hopeful. It's things we can actually do things we can be engaged in. And to me, one of the most wonderful lines in the Bible is towards the end of our reading tonight, you will be known for repairing the broken places, or in the translation you read, repairing the breach. Isn't that wonderful? You will be known for repairing the breach. Well, it goes without saying that the world needs more of that, doesn't it? Needs more of that. I, as I sat thinking about being with you tonight, I'm remembering almost exactly three years ago, and I was at, uh, I'll, I'll call it a dinner party, although it, it, it w wasn't really a party, um, but there were six of us from the congregation I served that had been invited to a home out in Hikes Point. And the hosts were a, a couple named Layla and Kakar. They were ethnic Turks who, whose families had been trapped in Russia since World War II and were finally released about 15 years ago. And our congregation had been a sponsoring congregation 
for them and their two toddlers and some other relatives to come to Louisville through Kentucky Refugee Ministries. And I remember many times I would have to go over to their little apartment off of Klondike Lane and check on what they were doing, you know, if they had the right clothing for the season or if they needed help getting to the grocery store. You know, the little details that you have to do with refugees when they first get here. And without fail, I, I would joke with my congregation, is like there's no, there's no quick visit <laughs> at that house. Without fail, Layla, if it was really early in the day, she would sit me down and give me like a hostess Twinkie and a Coke, which I had to eat at her table. If it was later in the day, I would just warn my wife, it's like, I'm not going to be home for supper because she's going to have some stew on and have me drink tea until the stew is ready. And then there'll be cheese and fruit and all this other stuff. And they had nothing, but she insisted on feeding me. And three years ago, here we are in a nice suburban home. They're well employed. Their little preschoolers are now young adults. They have two younger twins. And they have a feast spread, again, 12 years later, a feast spread for six of us from our church to say thank you. So as we sat at that table, we were, you know what we were talking about? Oh, there's a, there's a virus in China. I wonder what's going to happen next. And you know what happened next. But that meal has just stuck with me as a sign of what? A sign of grace. Um, now, the, the interesting question is, who was getting the grace? Was it them or was it us? And I think I have to say all of us. And so you see the, what we might think is good works, um, what we might think is the hard and gritty stuff is full of grace, even when we don't know it. And it comes back to us in waves. And so what is the fast God wants us to practice? It's that kind of ministry. It's that kind of grace. Amen. Please stand in body or in spirit as we affirm our faith. We believe in a God who chooses freedom, who unties every rope and carries our burdens. We believe in a God who ushers in the poor and the hungry, who has a seat saved for all of us. We believe in a God whose love is like the sun, who says, I'm here, I'm here, every time we cry. We believe in a God who walks before us in the parched places, who rescues our bones and tends to us like a gardener. And because we believe, we strive to choose love. Because we believe, we strive to pursue justice. Because we believe. Amen.
Now go in peace, and as you're going, know this. It is by the grace of God that you were brought into this world, by God's mercy that you've been sustained to this very moment, and by God's love, fully revealed in Jesus Christ, that you are being redeemed now and forevermore. Amen.